Uh, we're in a series in the book of Jeremiah, and uh, I've heard from many of you who've been reading through the book of Jeremiah that you've discovered, much as many of us have discovered, that this is a depressing book. <laughs> it is a little bit sad. It is a little bit difficult to get through in a lot of ways, but it teaches us tremendous things about the nations and about persons throughout the nations. Today, we're going to be in chapters 18 through 20, so if you have your Bibles, open up to Jeremiah chapter 18. I want to start today, though, by talking about uh, a toy, a particular childhood diversion that you probably know by smell. Were you to close your eyes and I held it up in front of your nose, you'd probably be like, oh yeah, I know what this is. In fact, many of you probably know this toy by taste. It's one of the least expensive toys, one of the most entertaining, most versatile, most disposable toys on the market. It's Play-Doh. Some, first service, somebody went, mmm. <laughs> like, okay, somebody definitely did taste it. Um, you knew it as a kid, right? You can probably recall memories of opening up those containers, especially when the container was brand new. You pop it open, and there in the center of that container sits that perfect cylindrical, uniformly colored piece of Play-Doh that's never been played with, right? And you pop it out, and you begin shaping what a joy. This really is what sets Play-Doh apart from other toys, right? The fact that you're, you, if you're skilled enough, you can bring most anything into being. It's, it's yours to command. You can shape it, make it into whatever you want. I remember being a kid, and probably many of you played restaurant with potato, or p potatoes, <laughs> maybe that too, with, with Play-Doh. And, uh, you know, you, you, so you made food items and stuff, and you p pretended that you were running a restaurant. I remember crafting lava monsters and, uh, and giant snakes for my He-Man action figures to do battle with. And they're action figures. They're not dolls. They're figures <laughs> intended for action. There were myriads of molds you could use, cookie cutter options, and even presses through which you could turn your Play-Doh into some form of spaghetti. The joy of Play-Doh is undeniable. In fact, were you to find out that there was, in fact, a cylinder of Play-Doh sitting behind each chair in that pocket. I bet I would have a difficult time keeping most of you, even adults, even old adults, from digging in there, pulling that out, and playing with it. Did anybody look? I wouldn't do that to myself. I am not that stupid. The pleasure of Plato, though, is contingent on a single feature. If it loses this attribute, the joy goes with it. It moves from being a joyful experience to just being downright sad. You know, the feature I'm talking about, don't you? Plasticity, malleability, pliability. If the Play-Doh ceases to yield to your hands, it is no longer a toy. It's just garbage. Parents know this pain all too well, right? You've all discovered Play-Doh mashed into the carpet or in some seam where it was unseemly for it to be there. Some horrible thing that you had to clean out or pry out or pick out with a butter knife or a fork because your kids did that. And kids, you remember too, when you opened up that cylinder expecting to play with that magical Play-Doh, but instead you got a rock, not unlike Charlie Brown. Boo. The capacity to be shaped, the capacity to be changed, that's what Play-Doh's all about. That's the joy of Play-Doh. And when it comes to us actually God dealing with individuals or God dealing with an entire nation, the same thing is at play. If a nation ceases to yield to God, then it is becoming garbage. If a person ceases to yield to God, then that person is fit for the trash heap. In Jeremiah chapters 18 through 20, we're going to talk about two different kinds of clay, and I bet you could decipher already which kinds of clay we're discussing. It's the clay that is shaped, and it's the clay that will not be shaped. There are two excursions that Jeremiah has to take related to these teachings. And um, the reason we're studying this, the reason that this is in here, is because God intended this to forge a memory in your mind, a tactile, visual memory that will shape the way you function for the rest of your life. As we consider what we're going to be talking about this week, I want you to start out with two questions in mind. And here are the two questions. What does it mean for me to be pliable, changeable? And secondly, when has God done changing me? 
Let's begin praying. Our Lord and God, um, we ask this week that you would open up your word to us again, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, that you would train us. Lord, I pray that every person in this room would walk away and for the rest of their lives retain this particular set of events and remember this particular teaching and be able to think of themselves and the places they dwell in terms of clay. God, speak to us, direct us. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to start today by talking about the beginning of the end. Secondly, we're going to talk about the clay condition. And lastly, we're going to talk about temple trash talk. Let's begin. Where are we? Where are we in this book? What is happening? Uh, here's the thing about a lot of Hebrew texts. They're not chronologically conveyed. In fact, there are a number of chapters in the book of Jeremiah that are completely out of order when it comes to chronology. That's because the Hebrews focused on things different than you and I do. When they wrote a text, they wrote it thematically in terms of importance or pertinence. And so it wasn't necessarily important in what order everything fell. What was important is that you got the right things in the right place to amplify something in someone's mind. Well, it's true also of this particular text. Now, um, the text we're going to be reading from today takes place in 609 BC. Um, remember, Jeremy, start, or Jeremy, how about Jeremiah, started his career in BC 627. So here's what this means. Jeremiah starts this message, is preaching as a prophet when he's very young. And you remember, that was part of the reason that most people wouldn't accept what he was saying. We are now 18 years later. So he is firmly established as one of those respectable adults, only without one thing, the respect. Jeremiah was still being treated harshly. Jeremiah was not entertained by the people. They still lacked respect for him. Why? Because as of yet in Israel's history, there has been no siege. That siege he kept talking about, that he keeps talking about, it still hasn't happened yet. And Babylon has not begun sacking any cities in Judea. Sometime during the year of this prophecy that we're getting right now in this text, sometime during this year that we're speaking of, is when Josiah dies. He's the king in Judea. Josiah, good king or bad king? Show me your thumbs. Correct. He's, he was a good king. He was a really good king. Josiah dies sometime during this year, and uh, his, uh, he dies in battle with Pharaoh Necho in Egypt, strangely enough, trying to prevent Egypt from getting to the north to help Assyria battle against Babylon, the nation that would eventually conquer Israel. So one of his sons is put on the throne by Pharaoh Necho, Jehoahaz is that fellow's name, and he ruled for a whopping three months. Wouldn't it be great if all politicians had that kind of tenure? Uh, after he had reigned for three months, he was taken into captivity by the king of Egypt, who then appointed Josiah's son, a fellow by the name of Eliakim, uh, now you're, or Eliakim. You're not probably used to seeing the term Eliakim in the scriptures. Eliakim's name was changed by Nico to Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim is the king who is now ruling, probably as Jeremiah is saying this, either that or he's in the tenure of that, that little snippet of the guy who was before him. So a synopsis of Jehoiakim's reign is given to us in the book of 2 Chronicles. You ready for it? Here's Je uh, Jehoiakim's reign in a nutshell. Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 5. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. How's it like that for an epitaph? Like on your tombstone. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. This is how he's remembered by the people. Now, 2 Chronicles 36 goes on to talk about some of that evil. But I want to say this. The prophecy we're going to be reading from today is given approximately four years out from the time when Babylon first moves against Judah. When Babylon first moves against Judah, Jehoiakim surrenders to the king of Babylon almost immediately, becoming a vassal in B.C. 605. Three years later, B.C. 602, Jehoiakim will rebel against Babylon because that's a great idea. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem to deliver an absolute beatdown to the people of Judea. During that time, the first batch of exiles leave the country to head to Babylon. 
And among those exiles are the most promising young men and women of the nation, including a little ragtag group of kids, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, what we're hearing today, and the reason this is important to us, is that this is the last prophecy that Jeremiah gives before all of that stuff takes place. This is Jeremiah prophesying at the end of a peacetime, the beginning of the end, as it were. This is the last time Jeremiah is going to be prophesying here in chapters 13 through 20 and in chapter 46 and 47, when people thought that Jeremiah was full of it and that his words meant nothing. The good news for Jeremiah is there's a vindication en route. People are going to see that what he's saying is coming to pass. The bad news is, what a painful I told you so to deliver. Time for a field trip. You guys remember going on field trips when you were in elementary school? Oh, that was fun. Pack that brown paper bag and make sure your name's on it so nobody else takes your lunch because you'd hate for somebody else to get your lunch. And then off you go on a field trip. Well, when God speaks to Jeremiah in these passages, there are two field trips through which God is going to convey this story about clay. The first of them takes place in the beginning of chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. Let's read together. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. See, normally God gives a prophet a message, and then he says, Now, here's where I want you to go to deliver this message. Twice in these verses, God is going to say, I've got a message for you, but you've got to go to the right place so that I can give you the message. And so this is what he does for Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house. You're going to see the potter working on the wheel. Now, why does God want Jeremiah to go to this specific place? Do you remember some of these earlier prophecies that Jeremiah gets? Hey, uh, what do you see, Jeremiah? Oh, I see the rod of an almond branch. Couldn't God have just sent a vision to Jeremiah? Hey, think about a potter's house, right? What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a potter turning something on the wheel. No, God wants him to go down there because God wants Jeremiah's eyes to take in the visual of what happens on that potter's wheel. Why? So that you will have a visual of what's happening on that potter, potter's wheel. Because it's important for you to sink this in as a memory. This is an important visual memory. God knows how we learn. And sometimes the visual makes a really big difference in how we see and perceive things. Time for a field trip. And so... Jeremiah witnesses the corrupted clay. Look at chapter 18, verse 4. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Potter's in the middle of turning the wheel. And he's, as he's turning, oh, by the way, if anybody wants an old school turning wheel, I was told that Tom, Tom Pratt has one. He's like, I'm looking for a good home for it. So if anybody wants to turn clay, talk to Tom Pratt. That's the end of the sermon today. No, it's not. <laughs> um, so he sees this, this clay spoiled in the hands of the potter. And what is the prerogative of the potter? What does the potter get to do? Start over. He gets to take that clay and mash it back down into nothing. So quick application, really quickly. In the scriptures, what does God say man is made of? initially, of the dirt, of the dust. In, in fact, um, some of you probably heard this story. When I was a, a child, my grandfather was an old minister. I come from a long line of people who've been in preaching ministries, and my grandfather was an old minister, and we were visiting him in Columbus. And uh, we went up there, and he, he looked at me as I came in the room. I'm just a little guy. And he says, Ben Hamin, your name means son of the right hand. I was like, Cool. And my older brother, Adam, came up and goes, what does my name mean, granddad? And he said, dirt. <laughs> uh, and it's true. And this is what, this is what Adam means. From the, from the dirt, I made him, right? I, I created him from the clay. And so in, in some regard, when God has Jeremiah in this setting, what he's seeing is meant to be this powerful visual impression of what's going on, not just with individuals, but even with nations. Now, have any of you ever done any ceramics? Anybody make pots, clay, mugs, or anything? Uh, ceramics was one of my favorite courses in high school. I loved that class. Uh, by and large, it was mindless creation time while listening to music. It was quite therapeutic. But clay can be finicky. 
When working with clay, there is a need to need. You have to smash that clay. You've got to work it to get all the air bubbles out. Why? Because if you don't get those air bubbles out, then when you put your clay into the kiln, it's going to blow up and destroy your project or somebody else's project that he spent a lot of time on. Not that I'm bitter. <laughs> clay needs more water sometimes. Clay needs less water at other times because it's useless with too much or too little. When you craft, you have to craft with a mind toward resilience, or else what you make will be quickly broken, or it will flop before its time. Uh, quite often, what seems like a promising project starts having serious issues, and then you're left with the condition, the prerogative of the potter, you must smash the clay and start over. You have to begin kneading again, you have to change the shape again, and you have to begin reworking from the beginning. And God says, this is how I'm dealing with you. Not just you individually, but even you as a nation. Is there a point at which clay cannot be reworked? Yes. What must be done with such clay? We'll get to that in the second field trip. So God shapes individuals, but God also shapes nations. Look at Jeremiah 18, verses 5 and 6. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. God's saying, I, I choose what to do with you. You are clay in my hands. It is my choice what to make of you. You are to become a vessel of my choosing. Who's responsible for what you become? Okay, now this is, this is difficult because if we ask this question for most of us, we'd be like, well, I do. This is my choice. I will choose who I am and what I shall be. And God says, that's right, you'll choose who you are and what you shall be. You shall be clay in my hands, and I will make you something. The power ultimately is his, and any clay that has a defect that will not yield to the potter's hands is then subject to the potter's wrath of reshaping. Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. At one moment, this is God speaking generally of all the nations, not just Israel, but of every nation that has ever been or ever will be. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. So here's God's policy. This is God's policy he's laid out for us. Look, if there's a nation, they're doing the wrong thing, and I'm going to destroy that nation. If the people will turn back, I can be counted on to forgive them and rework their nation. You remember this in Jonah's story? Jonah goes to Nineveh, one of the worst nations in the world. And he says, God's going to destroy you. And the Ninevites say, maybe we can repent. And they do. They nationally repent. And God says, cool, we're good. And then Jonah's mad because God won't, won't destroy them, right? This is God's pattern for dealing with nations. God goes on to describe this pattern in more detail. Look at verse 9 and 10. We're at another moment. I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. If you're an American, and probably most of you in this room are, you would probably place America in this condition initially, right? At least the founding fathers thought of themselves as doing that. This is a nation that will be one nation under God. This is going to be a nation forged by God, a nation for religious people. And so they found this nation, and it begins to build up. And clearly, this country has been blessed. Wouldn't you agree? But did you see God's promise in verse 10? If that nation turns from its ways, I'll think better of what I had intended to do with it. And I can remove those blessings. I am neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But when I look around at the world that we see right now, I look around at this country, I think this is the condition we're currently in. I think blessings have been or are being removed. And I think we are in sort of a depraved state where the nation is given an opportunity to repent or to choose destruction. Reworking Judea. Let's focus in on Judea in particular. Look at verse 11. So now then I speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a calamity against you, and I'm devising a plan against you. God's creating a plan for destruction, but look at the next verse. Here's the heart of God. Oh, turn back each one of you from his evil way, 
and reform your ways and deeds. What does God want? Does he want to destroy nations or peoples? No, he desires our reformation. Now we've learned the principle, God will threaten disaster, but the clay, if the clay will be pliable, willing to change according to God's will, then God will relent. But God not only delivers this message, but remember God has perfect hypothetical knowledge. He knows what if. And so God not only tells them what he's doing and asks them to repent, but then God anticipates their response to repentance. Verse 12. But they will say, it's hopeless. For we're going to follow our own paths, and each one of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. I think this would be just a great excuse in general for you to give. Like, would you t- do the dishes? No. I want to follow the stubbornness of my evil heart. Right? I doubt anybody specifically said this. Like, there's probably nobody standing there who's like, I'm not going to do it, God. I want to follow my evil, stubborn heart. Instead, because even tyrants, like the worst people in history, still think they're the good guys, right? But God's looking past a person. He's looking to the inner man, and he's saying, I know what's going on inside you. You might be outwardly trying to be compliant, but I know what you're doing on the inside. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. Have you ever looked at our culture and thought, it's hopeless? I bet that's a sentiment most of us have had. And it seems like a reasonable sentiment, even if you're a good person for this reason. Because even if I do everything I'm supposed to be doing, my neighbor's not going to. My neighbor's neighbor won't. How many people will do the virtuous thing? And how many people will do the evil thing? And so many of us look at a situation, we go, it's hopeless. Hey guys, are you responsible for turning the entire culture to right? No. Who are you responsible for? Yeah, exactly. Right? We tell this to our kids. You're responsible for you. It's your actions that you can control. It's your heart that you get some degree of choice as to what to do with. The problem in general is individuals think that they're accountable for altering a nation. And that seems like a project too big for any one person, because it is. Who are you responsible for? Me. Leo Tolstoy, uh, one of the world's great novelists, or Russian novelists, said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. I love, isn't that a great description of our generation? Isn't that a great description of social media? I'll tell you what's wrong with the world. If everybody would just listen to me, I could fix everything. All these armchair emperors deciding that they would make things right if only someone would put them in charge. And the message of God is the same. Change yourself. Become what I am trying to craft you into being. Let's talk about the clay condition. Have you ever been in the midst of an argument and realized that you were wrong? Some of you who are married make that mistake this morning before getting in here, right? You're in the thick of an argument, you start arguing, and you realize you're wrong. And my question to you is, what do you do in that moment? See, there are generally two responses, and I can tell you from having done a lot of marriage counseling that a lot of people make this choice. They think to themselves, well, I'm already mad in arguing. I may as well just keep pressing the issue, even though I'm wrong, so that I can make, convince them that whatever I'm saying is right, even when I know it's not right. And so they persist, and they're like, let's just burn every single bridge I've got, and let's make things as bad as it can possibly be, right? Now, the alternative is in the midst of the argument, as soon as you recognize I'm wrong, you could go, you know what? I just realized I'm wrong. I am sorry. I was in the wrong place saying the wrong thing. Nobody wants to do that. You know how liberating it is to do that? Oh, man, what freedom to just in the midst of it be, just go, my bad, my mistake. I was was wrong. I repent of what I just said. Now, Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is for this reason. You have arguments with God all the time. If you're a faithful Christian, I can guarantee you have debates with God where you go, Yeah, I know you think this, but I think it would be better if. Haven't you done that? Have we seen Jeremiah doing that over the past several chapters? Yeah. God, look, uh, we we repent. Remember his pronouns when he's speaking on behalf of the people? Look, if only you would do this, then this people would know and understand. Don't you realize, God, that there are false prophets bringing them a misguided word? 
Jeremiah is beginning to take shape as we go through these passages. Here's what I mean by that. Jeremiah is beginning to alter what he's saying to God, the way he thinks and the lenses through which he's viewing the world. God seems to be indicating that this nation, this people, they're going to continue to reject him no matter what. And early on, Jeremiah is like, that's not the case, God. If only you would do X, Y, and Z, I bet this people would turn back. And God's like, you're mistaken, sir. When it comes to you arguing with God, who's right? You know what's great about acknowledging that immediately? You save yourself so much effort and energy. And rather than having to be humble or humiliated, you just get on the right page right away. Listen to Jeremiah as he's speaking to the Lord. Jeremiah 18, verse 20. Should good be repaid with evil? For they have dug a pit for me. Underline that, by the way. He's going to say it again uh, down in, I believe it's verse 23. They've dug a pit for me. Now, if you're steeped in all of your Jeremiah lore, where does Jeremiah eventually end up? Literally in a cistern, literally tossed into a pit. So here's, here's a principle that I just note that's kind of interesting here. Sometimes when prophets speak, they prophesy even when they don't mean to. They've dug a pit for me. And later on when Jeremiah was tossed in this pit, I bet he hit the bottom and I bet he went, oh, okay, God, funny, real funny, <laughs> literally in the pit. For they have dug a pit for me. Then he says this, remember how I stood before you to speak good on their behalf so as to turn away your wrath from them? God, do you remember me coming to you and being like, hey, don't be wrathful against this people. Come on, I'm sure they're going to get it together. God, I tried to intercede for them, and now they're turning on me. They don't believe me. In fact, they're actually attacking me. Lord, can you believe that they're doing this? And I'm sure God was like, gasp. Who could have seen that coming? An absolute scandal. If only someone had known that was the way these people were going to behave. Oh, wait, that's what we said, wasn't it? Jeremiah is saying to God, hey, they, they are what you said they were. This people is just that stubborn and rebellious. Jeremiah 18, verse 22 and 23. Jeremiah's tune changes here a little bit. May an outcry be heard from their houses when you suddenly bring raiders upon them, for they have dug a pit to capture me and hidden snares for my feet. Jeremiah is now praying for the destruction of the people he's prophesying to. That doesn't mean he's enjoying it, but I want you to see that his words resemble what God has been telling him. In other words, the potter has shaped him, and now he's thinking differently than he has been thinking. Is your shape changing? I mean, not in the standard way that most of us have a shape that changes as we get older, right? Where you get sort of larger around the middle and sag. Is, is God changing you? Like, do you, when you think about your walk so far, if you think about how you thought like five years ago, are you thinking differently now? When you think about how you approach the country or yourself or your own spiritual life, are you less impressed with yourself now than you were when you first began to follow? Our shape should be changing. God says to Jeremiah, um, hey, when a clay is will wielding or willing to yield to me, I will remake that clay. And we see that God has this like long, enduring patience with clay that will be reformed. But what about the clay that is set? What about the clay that will not bend anymore? Well, field trip number two. Buy a jar, lead a parade. Jeremiah 19, verse 1 and 2. Let's look at it. Thus says the Lord, Go and buy a potter's earthenware jar and take some of the elders of the people and some of the senior priests. Then go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the potsherd gate. If you have your Bibles underlined potsherd. We'll explain why it's the potsherd gate in a moment. The entrance of the potsherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. So Jeremiah, I need you to leave the city, and, but you're not leaving by yourself. First, go to the temple and sequester some of the town elders, some of the city elders. Get some of the priests to follow you. Uh, when they ask you where you're going, just be like, we're going to where God tells me, and leave the potsherd gate and go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Nobody wants to go into the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Let me tell you why. The valley of Ben-Hinnom was a dump, literally. It was the middle of a garbage dump. In fact, I considered as a subtext 
for today's message entitling this, The Sermon from the Dump. Because he's going to go out and he's going to get a word from the Lord in the midst of the dump and speak to this people. Now, in the valley of ben Hinnom, let me tell you why it's a dump, there was a little rise, a small rise in the middle of the valley known as Topheth or Tophet. It was in this little rise in the middle of a valley that a statue to Moloch had been erected in days previous. Uh, Moloch was a demon deity that was worshipped by many of the people in Israel in one of the most grotesque practices in the ancient world. They would go out to this great iron body and head and belly, and they would stoke up an enormous fire in this particular idol. And then in an act of brutality that most of us cannot imagine, they would set infants and children on the glowing hot hands of this burning idol where the kids would begin to blister and peel and then roll down into the open gaping mouth of Moloch. It is at this place that God wants Jeremiah to deliver his message to the people of Israel. Now, during the reform led by Josiah, remember, Josiah, good king or bad king? Good king, very good king. Josiah threw down that altar and destroyed it. And he broke down the sacred places here. And in fact, the reason this is a dump is because Josiah said, everybody takes their garbage out to the Valley of ben Hinnom now. That place where we committed those abominations, that place is now a dump. Go throw your sewage out there. Go throw your garbage out there. I want that place burning. I want it uh, desacred, desacralized. I want it sacrilege. That's, nope. Defamed. That's the word I'm looking for. I want, I want this place defamed. I want it profaned, right? I want this place to become horrible. And so this is why it's the potsherd gate. What do you do with potsherds? They're like having broken glass around the house. You've got to get rid of them. And so you always take them out that gate. That's the potsherd gate. It goes down into the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, and you throw your garbage out there. It's fit for a garbage heap, and this sermon that God is going to have Jeremiah deliver has got a, maybe a dozen or less people out there with him. But I want you to go out into the middle of the garbage heap and go to this sacred space, and that's where I want, to tell, I want you to tell the people what's, what I'm about to do to them. Now, it's likely that since Josiah's death, his sons, who were wicked, have done nothing to impede the resurgence of some pagan practices. It's quite possible that when Jeremiah actually goes out to deliver this message, that the Topheth, this hill, has begun to be cleared as people prepare to offer sacrifices to Moloch again. Now, why would I think that? For one reason, because of the drought. See, when you have a drought and God's not going to deliver rain, then you got to do an end around. you gotta, you got to go appeal to another deity, right? Because if the good gods are not going to help us, why don't we turn to the demonic ones, the dark gods? Maybe they can send us rain. And we could offer children. And hey, here's the other issue. If we don't have water, we don't have food. And if we don't have food, who's hard to feed? Kids. It's quite possible that as Jeremiah goes to deliver this message, that they've already begun building up and getting ready to return to Moloch worship. This is the word that Jeremiah speaks. Jeremiah 19, verses 3 through 6. And say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, are there any kings of Judah with him right now? No. Uh, that, by the way, there's a king of Judah. And pretty soon there's going to be multiple kings of Judah because we're just going to run through a succession of kings. But they're not here. So Jeremiah is going to deliver a message that's going to have to be carried to the kings and the kings who are to come. Kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem, behold, I'm about to bring a calamity upon this place at which the ears of everyone that hears it will tingle, underline tingle in your Bible. That word's going to be interesting. Their ears will tingle because they have forsaken me and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices in it to other gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have ever known. And because they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent, that would be the babies who were being offered, and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. You might be thinking, Baal, I thought we said Moloch. Baal means Lord. And so Baal is something that's ascribed to a lot of ancient pagan deities. And so Baal Malech would have been the actual deity that was being worshipped here. You offered your sons and daughters, a thing which I never commanded nor spoke of, nor did it even enter my mind. 
Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place will no longer be called Topheth or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but rather the Valley of Slaughter. The Hebrew word for tingle is tsal. Try that. Tsal, all right? It's the word they use for the crashing of a cymbal. It kind of sounds like a crashing cymbal, right? Tsal, right? Uh, it's also the word that they would use for a shattering pot. Now, when he said, everybody who hears this, their ears are going to tingle, he didn't mean like people would hear this and be like, ooh, that's pleasant. He meant it would be like somebody was taking cymbals and crashing them in your ear, or more importantly, like somebody shattered a pot right next to your head. You would be startled at what you heard. And when you looked, what would you see? Disaster. Destruction. See, God is going to reshape every piece of clay. Whether it is the yielding pot or whether it is the pot that is hardened and stiffened up and will not move. Clay can be reworked because it's pliable. It's still willing to be moved. But when it's dried and fired, it can no longer be shaped. The only thing to do with such a broken pot is to further break it. Now, it's interesting. uh, If you've studied Levitical law, if, if you've read in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, they've got protocols for how to deal with profaned articles from your house. And in one of these like subtle weird moves, if you've got an iron pot, all you do is scour it and then it's perfectly clean and acceptable to use again. But if you have an earthenware pot and it is profaned, do you know what you have to do with it? Smash it. Now that's not good news for most people except the potters. They're thrilled with that, right? Because that means there's going to be this constant supply of people who need to repurchase pots because their pots became ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. What this does is I think it throws us forward to this exact teaching for a reason. God's setting a type in the minds of those people who are hearing this. Jeremiah 19, verse 10. Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who will accompany you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, just so I will break this people and this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot again be repaired. I'm destroying it. I'm going to destroy all of this. And man, I bet that was a fun part of the sermon to deliver. You like breaking things? Come on, that's fun. And right in the middle of the sermon to just smash something down, boy, that'd wake people up. Now, just as the people have been using this valley to dump their garbage, God goes on to say that this is where we are going to dump your bodies like refuse. This is where you guys are going. You are the garbage that will fill up this dump. Now, important note for this, because if you're like, man, this is just a whole lot of stupid trivia. Why do we need to talk about this? The Valley of Ben-Hinnom will later be referenced by another name. That name is Gehenna. In Jesus' day, it's still a dump. In Jesus' day, people were still throwing their garbage out there. And in Jesus' day, this is the term Gehenna that Jesus uses to describe hell. It's a good description of hell. What is hell ultimately? It's the place where the universe's garbage gets dumped, where the unusable and unyielding things, where they go in the afterlife. So from this section and from the clay, I want you to remember two things. First of all, there are two kinds of shaping that are going to be taking place. One is being shaped into the image of God. And that's good. God desires that of people and God desires that of nations. How do we know God desires that of people? Well, he says it over and over again in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree to another. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. I'm making you something different. Romans 8, 29, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. 1 John 3, 2, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Colossians 3, verse 10, we've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Your knowledge, your understanding of God should be shaping you into who he is, into the likeness of Christ. Mission accomplished on planet Earth if that happens with you. Pretty cool, right? What about those who won't? 
Well, there's another event that takes place. It's a cosmic exile event, and it's on its way. Either you've been clay in the master's hands, being forged in the likeness of his son, or you followed the dictates of your heart, and you have hardened into the shape that is unusable for God, in which case there's nothing to do with you but throw you into the rubbish heap of history. Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, the valley of slaughter, hell. Well, on that upbeat note, let's shift to our last point, talking trash in the temple. Uh, my two younger boys are trash talkers. It is in their nature. They can't help themselves. They can't hold back the words. I've told some of you this story before. I'll go ahead and tell it now. Um, when Colton first came to live with us, he was uh, it just kind of moved from three to four years old, and uh, he has severe ADHD. So we were like, we got to get this kid in a sport. And so we put him in soccer right away. So he was playing with a group of four and five-year-olds, and in his first, his very first soccer game, he walked up to the line where they stand opposite the other kids. Remember, the ref is checking your cleats, and he's giving you sort of his last-minute instruction. And Colton walked up to that line without missing a beat. He starts pointing at other kids. I'm going to take the ball away from you. And starts doing the two-fingered, I'm watching you number, and he's just... He's going to town. Nobody trained him to do this. He's just doing it. Lisa and I are sitting on the sidelines, completely mortified, like, I don't know whose kid that is, but somebody needs to, <laughs> somebody better step it up in the home. Bad example somewhere, it must be. When we talk trash here, we're, we're literally talking trash. Remember, where does this sermon start for Jeremiah? He's in a dump. And so he's going to take the sermon on the road, but then he actually does some trash talk in the temple. So it's really beautiful how all that poetically worked out to come together here so that I could make this point. Jeremiah wants to try the sermon in the temple. I bet this sermon was pretty profound when he gave it. I bet when he's standing out in the middle of this valley and he's talking to all these elders and he's talking to the priests and they're hanging on his every word because they've already walked all the way out into the dump and they're in this dramatic place and he says to Saul, you know, and he throws that pod down and it breaks and shatters everywhere. I bet they were all like, oh, and startled. And Jeremiah probably thought, man, I need a bigger audience for this. I had props. It was awesome. You should have seen the response. But Jeremiah 19, verse 14. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people. Now, where did the Lord send him to prophesy? Look at verse 14. Topheth. Where is he going? Let's go to the temple. I don't know if God told him to go to the temple. I did not read it there. God did not seem to say, Jeremiah, go to the temple. But that's where Jeremiah decides to go. And things don't work out so well for him when he gets to the temple this time. Of course, Jeremiah, being the calculating diplomat that he is, is going to bring soft words and just gently nudge the people toward God. Not so much. Uh, how's he start? Well, he starts by calling them a stiff-necked people. You're like donkeys, he says. 19, verse 15. Thus says the Lord of hosts, and I can still see Jeremiah all fired up, and he's coming in, and he's like, here we go. This is the time where I really deliver it. Thus says the Lord God, the hosts of Israel, or uh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'm about to bring on this city and all of its towns the entire calamity that I have declared against it, because they have stiffened their necks so as not to heed my words. Here's the thing about this message. Jeremiah's been saying this for 18 years now, right? They've all heard this. If you've been to the temple during the last 18 years, chances are you heard Jeremiah at some point saying something just like this in the temple courts. Which means this, most people have come to ignore what he's saying. Now there's one big difference in the last 18 years. Josiah is probably dead now. Josiah, good king or bad king? Good king. Josiah very much respected the word of the Lord, which means the prophets probably, under, uh, probably enjoyed tremendous protections in Josiah's reign. But if Josiah is not around anymore, well, then all bets are off. Let's see what happens. Pasher, or if you want a wrestling name for him, Pasher the Basher. You go ahead and write it in your margin. It's a, it's a good way to remember him. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. 
When Pasher the priest, the son of Immer, who was the chief officer of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pasher had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him into stocks that were at the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. Now, who's Pasher? Did you see in the text? Well, he's a priest. He is either an important priest in the temple as a chief officer or related to somebody who's very important in the temple. And according uh, to this verse, he's also considered a prophet. Maybe he considers himself a prophet or other people consider him a prophet. So a priest related to somebody important who also considers himself to be a prophet. Do we know anybody else who fits that paradigm in this story? Jeremiah. Jeremiah is all of these things, which means what we're getting here is a little professional hostility. Why? Because I bet this guy's saying the exact opposite of what Jeremiah's been saying. What's the difference between the two guys? Pasher has the temple guard. And so what does Pasher do? He has Jeremiah beaten. Now, the way this is phrased in the Hebrew can either mean that this was a game of fisticuffs, like Pasher literally jumped on Jeremiah and started punching him, which I've got to imagine makes for an interesting church service. Or it can mean, and I think it might mean this, that Pasher had Jeremiah seized and bound and flogged publicly and then taken outside of the temple and put in a very uncomfortable position. You know anybody else that happened to? You can say it. Jesus, absolutely. And so here's Jeremiah. He's beaten. He's taken out. He's put in stocks. The word stocks in the Hebrew is the word for twisted, which means he was put into a device that kept his body contorted, and he was left there for an entire day. You ever sit in an uncomfortable chair? That's still a chair. You imagine being, you know, sitting and all contorted throughout an entire 24 hours period? So Jeremiah is placed near the Benjamin Gate in an uncomfortable position, probably with his back fully opened and certainly beaten, humiliated, on view as a public display for all the people who are coming and going to the temple. Jeremiah 20, verse 3 through 6. Let's look at Jeremiah talking a little trash. On the next day, when Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, Pasher is not the name the Lord has called you, but rather, Megar Misabib, zing! <laughs> Got him! We, you don't know what that means, <laughs> right? The term Megar Misabib means terror on every side. Now, I want you to think about what's happening here. Pasher, the name Pasher, means something like peaceful or at ease. And Jeremiah's just been beaten by this dude and put in the stocks. And now, Jeremiah, if you were in stocks, if you had just been beaten, if the Lord, the God of this universe, said to you, I'm making you an iron pillar and a bronze wall, don't be afraid of them, Jeremiah. And then you've just found yourself publicly flogged and beaten and put in the, put in the stocks, who are you probably having a conversation with? I'm guessing God. I'm guessing you've got a conversation with God where you're like, so what exactly did you mean when you said iron wall, or I mean, a bronze pillar, or a bronze wall and iron pillar? Like, it sounded like you were going to make me indestructible, and I'm sitting here having suffered an absolute beatdown. What is going on, God? Like, what are you doing here? What are you trying to accomplish? And God pulls back the veil a little bit. He goes, hey, who beat you? Pasher. Pasher is a name we think means at ease or at rest. He goes, I got a different name for him. Magar Misabib. And Jeremiah's probably like, good, pretty good. <laughs> uh, can I tell him that? I'm going to tell him that. <laughs> All right. Now, um, here's, what, here's what I want us to take away from this. Um, this is important. When God says, I'm going to make of you something resilient, something that's going to alter the world. When God says, I'm going to keep you strong in the face of your adversary, does that mean you're not going to suffer? No, no, it does not. Just like they said in the New Testament, pressed down but not crushed, persecuted, not the despairing, struck down, not destroyed. And we have this treasure in earth and vessels, right? We, we know who we are and what we are in Christ, and we're experiencing things that are difficult during the course of this life, and that's who we are, and sometimes God needs us to go through those things. Like in this instance in Jeremiah's life where he becomes 
a foretaste of what Christ would experience. I mean, think about how cool that is. Jeremiah is getting to experience something that the Christ would experience later on. What an honor. Jeremiah says, hey, your, word, uh, your word's been a little bit tough to carry. You can imagine in his situation, he probably feels like that. After he leaves the moment of trash talking with Pasher, he turns his thoughts to God. Look at Jeremiah 20, verse 7 and 8. I don't know if you've ever talked to God like this. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. Nice job, God. You got me really good. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. And I think Jeremiah is saying this literally. Like, this has been my experience. God, you put me in a condition where they were going to publicly mock me and walk past me and ridicule me. This is a people you called me to speak to. And look how they're treating me, God. I can't believe you would let your own servant experience something like this. Would you go through something like this, God? For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction. Because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. Your word, God, is the reason I'm hated. You suckered me into a really awful situation. You pulled one over on me. Congratulations, God. I had no idea it would be this bad to speak on your behalf. But then Jeremiah continues. Verse 9. But if I say, I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then my heart becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in. I I cannot endure it. You think Jeremiah has actively tried to suppress this message several times in his ministry? You think he's walked into the temple courts before and God went, okay, do it again. And he went, nope, I'm thinking about something else now. God, I can't. Okay, here we go. And he just launches it. Why? Because he says, your word is like the Kool-Aid man. It just breaks through. Like I try, to, I try to repress it. I try to keep it back. And it just bursts out of me. It's like I've got no choice in it. And then he says one of the coolest things I think I've ever heard of God. And I love this. Because this is in direct response to some of what he's been experiencing. He calls God the dread champion. There's a new name for God for praying, right? When you're in a situation where you're like, well, it's quite a pickle here, God. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. You are my dread champion. You are my fierce, tyrannical, ruling over Lord who can sweep in and destroy any of my adversaries. Verse 10. Uh, Verse 10 speaks of how Jeremiah continues to hear all those who surround him desiring to see him destroyed, but then he's like, yeah, but you're not just attacking a prophet at this stage of the game. There's somebody else who's with me. Verse 11, but the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. How long is their disgrace going to be present? Forever. Everlasting disgrace. I bet that helped Jeremiah cope with this whole pasture situation a little bit. Verse 12, yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have sent forth my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hands of the evildoer. What an awesome phrase, right? I recognize God is my power. It would be so cool if we could end at verse 13. But then you look at verse 14. Cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me. Woe is me. Right back into Eeyore syndrome, right? And and I thought about just ending at 13 today, but I wanted to get 14 in for this reason. Um, I think this, this little back and forth that Jeremiah is having in his own life, I think this is indicative of who we are a lot of the time, right? Did Jeremiah know God's will? Yeah, he'd heard it. God spoke to him plainly. Did Jeremiah understand what God was about to do? Yeah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah had all the right answers about what was coming about. Jeremiah knew that he was going to suffer and experience difficulty, but shouldn't he have known to trust God? Yeah, shouldn't you? 
And yet most of us, when we have the right answers, when we know what God's up to, we still find ourselves in those conditions a lot of time going, nobody likes me. Woe is me. It would be better had I never been born. I want you to see this because I want you to remember that everybody you're reading about in Scripture is a real person. So is Jeremiah. And what he's doing right now is what you and I do when we find ourselves in similar circumstances. What do we take away from today? Well, we have a message for individuals and entire nations on the importance of pliability. Will you let God change you and will you be conformed into his likeness? Will our nation allow God to change us, to be conformed into his likeness? We also get a warning about what happens to the person or nation who will not be shaped by God. These are vessels fit for destruction, vessels to be shattered in the garbage heap of history. And lastly, we see that the word of God will get us in trouble. Amen? It does. But we also see that the word of God, if it truly sits within you, cannot be restrained. It's like the Kool-Aid man breaking through. And lastly, the God is our dread champion. When it comes down to it, who is God going to vindicate? Every believer, every person who's thrown their lot in with him, he is the dread champion who will show up and who will make it all right. So I want to return as we close out to those first two questions. What does it mean for me to be pliable? Look in your mirror tomorrow when you get up in the, in the morning and you walk up with your bad breath from having slept all night where it's like a toxic waste dump has been sitting in your mouth. And step in front of that mirror and look at your ugly mug. Or I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, your beautiful mug. It's my ugly mug when I'm talking about me. And I want you to look in the mirror and, and say, will you be shaped for God today? Are you pliable? And look at yourself in the mirror. Ask that question. Will you be shaped by him today or will you resist the potter and require a restart? And secondly, when has God finished shaping me? Friends, you don't cross the finish line until you're done with life. So whether you're nine years old in this room today or you're 96 years old in this room today, God's got something to do with you today to make you more like him. Let's go to the master, the potter, the dread champion in prayer. Lord, we want to be more like you. God, thank you for this visual of human history. Thanks for showing us what's happening as you work with the nations. Thanks for showing us what's happening as you're trying to work with us. God, I pray that we would take seriously the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, the idea of hell. God, that we would be those who yield to you. Lord, be our dread champion. May your word be in us, and may we be altered for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.